than a wicked and hip hop. Bad, bad, and a wicked and This is an introduction to database systems. Um, those of you familiar with the class uh, may know that it's usually taught by uh, Andy Pavlo. And as I'm sure some of you may have realized, I am not Andy Pavlo. Uh, my name is Andrew Crotty. I'm a postdoctoral researcher here at uh, CMU. And my research focuses mainly on database systems and data management. Uh, you may also have realized that my co-instructor for the course, uh, Lin Ma, is also not Andy Pavlo. Uh, he is a postdoc here as well, and he's uh, one of Andy's former PhD students. So um, at this point, you might be wondering where Andy is, and uh, he's actually on leave this semester um, because he's filming a, a Netflix documentary that's a follow-up uh, to last year's Tiger King. Um, and I, unfortunately, I can't say anything more uh, because of the NDA that I signed, but um, you should definitely check this out when it's, uh, when it's released. So with that, um, let's move on to the course material. Uh, one last thing before we begin, uh, I wanna thank um, Google BigQuery for helping us with uh, course development this semester. Um, I'm sure all of you know what, what Google is, but uh, BigQuery specifically is a, uh, a database product. It's a, a fully managed um, cloud data warehouse. So we might call it platform as a service. And uh, essentially, you give them your data, and then you can query it, run all sorts of analytics, machine learning, that kind of stuff. Um, and at the end of the semester, uh, there's, there's going to be someone from Google uh, who comes here to give a guest lecture and tell you about kind of all the, the cool stuff they're doing. Uh, and you, you'll be able to see a lot of the topics that we cover in the course actually applied uh, in practice. And they'll, they'll uh, be able to talk more about kind of the, the problems that come up when um, uh, dealing with, with uh, uh, data at this scale. So um, today's agenda, we're just gonna go over the kind of beginning, what is this course, course logistics stuff, um, and then there'll be sort of like a mini half lecture at the end uh, where we'll, we'll just kind of go through some of the core concepts uh, that we're going to cover in the course. So uh, depending on timing, we might get out a few minutes early. Um, to start off with the wait list, uh, I do not control the wait list. Um, it is way above my pay grade. Uh, as students are gonna be moved off of the wait list uh, based on your position. Um, as new spots in the class open up. So uh, if, you, if you send us emails, there's nothing that I personally can do about it. It's just gonna be based on order. Um, and if you're not currently enrolled in the course, um, the, the likelihood that you'll get in, I mean, uh, things will probably uh, firm up over the next week or so, but um, uh, unfortunately, you might not be able to get in. But we do plan to make all of the uh, course materials public. We're gonna put the lectures, uh, lecture videos on YouTube and um, all, all the material will be there so you'll, you'll be able to follow along. Uh, in, in terms of lecture rules, uh, please interrupt me at any time uh, if any of these things happens, either I'm speaking too fast, uh, if you don't understand something that I'm talking about, or if you have a, a database-related question, chances are that uh, if you have a question, then, then um, someone else does too. And uh, if this, this is kind of a big room, uh, if, I, if I can't quite hear you or if I don't, if I don't see you right away, just uh, try to uh, interrupt me at a, at a, a good point where I can uh, take a question. So uh, just a, a, at a high level, um, this course is specifically about the design and implementation of database management systems. So that means we're going to be looking at the software uh, that manages databases. So this isn't a course about uh, how to use a, a DBMS to build applications. So like imagine if you had a building a web application and you wanted to store uh, your user, user data in, in a database. Um, this, this class is not about that. Uh, and it's not a class about how to administer a, a database system. So they're all, all sorts of um, jobs out there where, where people's entire role is to essentially uh, manage the software that manages the data. Um, and that's, that's also not, not the, the topic of this course. So there are other courses, unfortunately, one of them um, is not being offered this semester. Um, 
and I, I don't know if it's offered anymore, um, but that, that bottom course is the one that, that uh, covers those topics. Okay, so just at a high level for the rest of the semester, the uh, topics that we're going to be covering, uh, we're going to be starting with um, a, a relational model, and that's, that's a data model for databases, and that's going to be uh, the main theme for the entire course. So we're going to talk primarily about relational database management systems. There are all sorts of other um, data management systems, NoSQL, some of you may have heard of, graph databases, all sorts of things. Um, we're going to be focusing on relational databases in this course. And uh, we're going to sort of build up um, from the bottom level all the way up through the stack uh, to look at the different uh, parts of a database management system, starting with the storage, how you actually physically store the data um, in memory and on, on uh, persistent storage, like a hard drive or an SSD. Then we're going to move up and talk about um, query execution and kind of how you can uh, either uh, put data into, update the data uh, that you've stored or retrieve the data. Uh, then we're going to move on to kind of concurrency control. So imagine you have several um, processes that are concurrently trying to access the database. How can you uh, sort of keep all of those together and manage them? Um, the next piece that we're going to cover is recovery. So if your database crashes or if, if uh, the machine crashes, um, how can you kind of make sure that your data is safe and persistent and you can kind of recover from those uh, types of situations? And then towards the end of this, this semester, we're going to cover some more advanced topics, um, distributed database management systems, and kind of just a general um, review of, of uh, some advanced topics. So uh, in terms of logistics, uh, the course policies and the schedule are all on uh, the web page. Um, academic honesty, I'm going to talk about this uh, in, in later in the slides, but uh, please um, don't do anything stupid. Uh, if, if we catch you um, plagiarizing or copying work or those sorts of things, it's going to be a big problem. I, I'll have to do a lot of paperwork. Um, and it's going to be a big problem for you. So just please, it's easier uh, if you don't do it. If you have any questions, if you're not sure about anything, uh, please uh, either send an email to me or Lynn or one of the TAs um, and just ask, like, is, is this thing that I'm doing okay? Um, and uh, you can also refer to the, the CMU policy page. Uh, ironically, um, that link there is broken. I checked it this morning. Their, their uh, uh, web page is down, but um, there's a cached version somewhere, or, or I can uh, make it available to you if you, if you email me. So, um, all of the discussion and announcements for the course will be on Piazza. Um, and if, if there's something that you need to contact either me or Lynn about, just uh, private, private, privately, um, a sensitive subject, just please send us an email um, and we can coordinate something to, to speak. So the textbook for the course um, is, is the, this Database Systems Concepts book, um, also known as the, the Sailboats book. Uh, there are, uh, so the, I, I'm not sure about the, the exact difference between the sixth and the, the seventh edition. I think all of the material that we're gonna cover in this course is available in the sixth edition. Um, if you have that or wanna, wanna uh, buy that version. Um, I don't think that the seventh edition is available as like a hard um, cover book anymore. I think it's like a, a loose leaf pages that are, uh, you get sent and they have like a three hole punch in them. Um, but we'll also be providing uh, uh, lecture notes uh, that, that will cover all of the topics as well as things that we cover in class that aren't um, covered in the book. So in terms of grading, uh, this is going to be the breakdown for um, how your grades are calculated, 15% for homeworks, 45% for projects, 20% um, for the midterm exam, and 20% for the final exam. So it's, it's pretty heavily weighted towards uh, homeworks and the, the projects. Uh, for homeworks, there are going to be five assignments that are, are spread out over the course of the semester. Um, the first homework is, is a, a SQL assignment, so SQL is a, we're going to talk about it a little bit at the end of this class and um, 
in the, the next class, but it's a, a query language that you use uh, to interact with the database management system. So the first homework assignment is going to be able to write some SQL queries um, to answer some uh, questions from a, a sample database we'll give you, and the rest are going to be um, paper and pencil assignments where you kind of like uh, apply formulas or uh, solve different like conceptual problems uh, for topics we cover in class. And again, I mentioned earlier, um, all homework should be done individually. Um, you shouldn't be you know, sharing answers or doing group assignments. They're all individual assignments um, and should be done individually. And we'll be checking for um, kind of copied uh, solutions to things. So um, the projects uh, are, are focused around this idea that you're going to build up your own um, database engine over the course of the semester. So like I said, kind of we'll start at the lower levels and we'll work our way up through the stack. Um, but what this means is that each project is going to build on the previous ones. So for example, if you have to implement a, a storage manager earlier on, the, the later projects may interact with that storage manager to get uh, data in and out. So for that reason, it's, it's important that you kind of keep up and move along. If you get too far behind on, on you know, these early projects, then uh, it's going to be really difficult or impossible um, to, to catch up later on in the semester. So an important thing, and this was kind of already um, mentioned in the announcement for the first project, but um, we're not going to be teaching you how to write or debug C++ code um, in this class. It's a prerequisite for the course. We expect, um, this is a high level, higher level course, we expect that you know um, kind of C++ as a, as a prerequisite. So uh, if you go to you know, TA office hours and are asking things like what is a string or what is a shared pointer, that kind of stuff, uh, we, we've told them not, not to answer those kind of questions. So um, we expect you to be comfortable working with C++. Uh, that's kind of why this, this Project Zero is released and it, it needs to be completed um, by September 13th for you to uh, continue in the course. So, uh, it, it's kind of meant as like a as like a self check kind of thing where if you're if you're really struggling with Project Zero then um, this might might not be the course for you because later on um, you, you're not going to be able to do the, the more complicated programming projects. So all of the projects um, for the course will be implemented using um, the CMU DB Group Bus Hub Academic DBMS. Um, it is kind of a, a, an academic system, so it's not really a full-fledged uh, database system, but um, it, it has these kind of modular pieces, and, and uh, we'll go through some of these things and make more sense uh, later in the course, but it has kind of this disk-based storage architecture, where, as I said, it uh, can read and write data from disk. Um, it, it has a Volcano-style query processing um, uh, setup where uh, you can kind of chain together iterators, basically, um, to, to iterate over your data and answer queries. Uh, it has pluggable APIs that will leverage to be able to implement the different uh, pieces of the system that you're going to implement for the projects. Um, and it, it currently does not support uh, SQL, so um, you won't be interacting with it through SQL. You'll kind of be interacting, interacting with it through um, lower level um, tests, test programs that, that uh, we provide. Okay, so the next thing is the late policy. Um, you lose uh, ten point, or sorry, ten percent of the points for a project, uh, or homework for every twenty four hours uh, late that you you hand it in. So um, if uh, you know if you hand it in after the deadline, we'll round up. Uh, so if it's four hours late, then it's going to be ten percent off, and we'll round up to the next. Um, full day. Uh, you're going to have a total of four late days over the course of the semester to be used um, for projects only. So not for the homeworks, it's only for the programming projects. Um, and you're free to allocate them as you wish. Uh, for example, you could um, turn in one project four days late or uh, you know, four projects each one day late. 
Uh, the only thing that you cannot use them for um, is, is the project number zero. That has to be done by September uh, 13th for you to, to continue, of course. Um, we're, we're, I, there's a, a pandemic still going on. I know that there's uh, a lot of um, uncertainty and things that can come up. So uh, we're, we're also going to grant no penalty extensions due to um, extreme circumstances, so like a medical emergency or a family emergency. Um, just if something comes up, um, I, I realize you know at the time you might not be able to, but as soon as you can, uh, just contact us and let us know what's going on. Um, and we can we can try to make arrangements for you. Okay, so again, uh, I want to reiterate the plagiarism warning. Um, I I know this is redundant, but I I really want to get this out there. And so you've all seen it, and there's there's video of me telling uh, all of you about it. So later on, if you run into any problems, um, there's no excuse for not not knowing what this is. So the. The homework and the projects must be your own original work. Uh, they're not group assignments. They're not meant to be done together in groups. Uh, you, you cannot copy source code from other people, your peers, or the web. Um, in general, there's uh, not a t since, since this is kind of a, a, an academic system and we change the um, projects each semester, there shouldn't be uh, like one for one solutions to um, the projects that we're going to give you online. But I still, if there's any, any source, source code out there, please don't copy it. Um, we're not going to, to tolerate plagiarism and um, it, it is going to be a big problem. So please do not do it. Um, so kind of the last administrative thing is office hours. Uh, we're still waiting on a, a clarification from the university about what we're supposed to do for uh, in-person versus remote office hours. So you may have noticed the website does not have uh, either the instructor or TA office hours yet. Um, but as soon as we get this, hopefully within the, the next day or two, um, we will update you. Uh, so we'll put it on the website and we'll send out a message um, to the class. If, if you need to contact us sooner, uh, about anything at all, please just either send us an email or uh, you can reach out uh, if it's something that's a, a more general question, you can reach out um, on, on Piazza. Okay, so uh, for the fun stuff, database research, um, there is a vaccination database tech talk seminar series uh, that will take place, uh, I believe on Zoom, um, Mondays uh, at 4.30 p.m. Uh, starting on 9.13, Monday 9.13. Um, there's a link to the schedule there. You can access it. Uh, and we are going to have a whole bunch of excellent uh, um, people from each of these, these uh, either database companies or projects uh, come and talk about their system. And these aren't like uh, marketing people that are just going to say, hey, use our system. They're, they're uh, technical people that are going to come and give technical talks about um, the, the actual internals of their system. So low-level stuff, kind of the, the design stuff um, that we're talking about uh, in this course. So if you're interested in that, please uh, uh, check it out. You can check out the, uh, the website there. So, that is kind of all of the uh, administrative logistics part of um, this lecture. So uh, if there are any specific questions so far, uh, I'd be happy to answer them. And then we can move on to the um, fun database stuff. Cool. OK, and again, uh, all of this stuff uh, that I mentioned should be available on uh, the website, either currently or, as I said, in the case of Office Hour and stuff, shortly. Um, so you can check there, and if, if you have any questions, just send us an email or ask on uh, uh, the Okay, so databases. Let's start with what is a database. Um, just out of curiosity, how, like, you can just raise your hands, how many of you regularly interact with a database management system databases. It doesn't have to be like 
on the command line, writing SQL queries. No one, no, no databases. Right. Um, it, it, I find that a little hard to believe. Uh, so SQLite is a, a database management system. Um, it is probably the most widely deployed uh, database management system in the world. Um, for any of you that have uh, a smartphone, it's used in iOS and Android. Um, web browsers, I don't know if you use web browsers. Uh, there's Chrome and Safari both use uh, SQLite for um, storing data. Um, and if, uh, if you ever made a call with Skype, Skype uses uh, uh, SQLite behind the scenes. So I, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that um, pretty much behind every uh, application anywhere where you need to store data, um, there's probably a database management system running in the background handling things for you. So um, a, a database is essentially an organized collection of interrelated data um, where you're trying to uh, model or capture some aspect of uh, uh, the real world. So to think about like a real world entity, for example, if I have a database to model uh, students in the class, um, each individual student is a data point that would be stored in my uh, um, database. So just as a, as a practical example, uh, let's create a database that models a, uh, a digital music store, something like uh, the Apple Music Store, iTunes Music Store, or uh, something similar where you want to keep track of, we'll just, for now, to simplify things, we'll just keep track of uh, artists and the albums that they release. So uh, the things that we're going to need are, you know, to know about individual artists and um, kind of a, a record of, over time, the, the different uh, albums that they released. And the way we can do this, just as a, as a stra straw man sort of example, is using uh, flat files. So uh, imagine that we want to store our database in um, uh, just a comma-separated comma value CSV file, um, kind of where each, each uh, uh, row or line in the file represents one you know, data entity, so an artist or an album, and kind of each uh, column is going to represent a um, uh, an individual attribute about that entity. So, um, you know, pretend we don't know anything about any kind of, you know, database management systems that are out there, like MySQL, Postgres, Oracle, SQLite, any of that stuff. Um, pretend we don't know about that, we're just kind of building a, an application up uh, ourselves. And what this is going to require is that um, the application needs to uh, parse the file each time it wants to read anything, and it's going to have to you know, read a line, split the CSV, um, and kind of figure out what's going on every single time we want to access the data. So um, again, here's, here's just a, a simple example using the um, music store where we have two essentially tables stored as CSV files. So there's the artist table where we have the, the name of the artist, uh, the year they, they first started um, releasing music in the country they're from. And in this uh, second album table, um, we have the, the name of the album, the artist that released it, and the year it was uh, released. So now let's say that, that we want to issue uh, essentially a query on, on the data that we have, and we want to know the year uh, that Ice Cube went solo. Um, I don't know if you know the. Ice Cube had, had some uh, uh, disagreements about the amount of money he was making, so he, he decided to go solo um, and start releasing albums on his own. So um, I guess the, the, the way that we would do this if we have these CSV files is um, we write, you, know, you write some kind of like a, a Python program that looks something like this, where uh, essentially you open up the file and then you iterate over every line in the file. Um, what we have to do is take the line, Remember, it's just a CSV uh, string. You have to parse it into a record. And then what we want to do is check if the um, uh, value at position zero in the record is ice cube, because we're looking for one ice cube, when solo. And uh, you want to print out the, uh, the year. So we're going to cast the, the, um, 
the second value in the string to an int um, and return that. So I, I guess, what's the problem with this? It seems pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Um, I mean, I guess your, your query could change. Maybe you want to know when Notorious B.I.G. went so low um, or started releasing music. You could uh, uh, just swap out the ice cube for, for uh, a different name and get a different result. Or if you want to know the country that someone's from, um, just change the, the position um, that you're printing out there. So I guess this seems fine, um, but can anyone think of you know, any issues that might come up if, if you're managing things this way? Uh, that is true. So if um, the, the data gets really large, then what you're going to have to do is kind of open the file and iterate over all of the, uh, the, the lines here. I guess what you could do is uh, modify this a little bit to as soon as you know that there's only one um, record you're looking for in this case, you could modify it a little bit to just return as soon as you find it. But uh, that's certainly true. Uh, if, if, you're, if you're not careful with how you code this, then uh, you might end up um, iterating over every single line in the file every single time. Yeah. Also, not that there's only one that's not working, so that uh, directly. That is another problem that can come up. So that the um, statement was that there could be uh, uh, duplicate entries for IceCube, and there's no way to ensure um, using this method that. Uh, um, Someone doesn't come in and you know put in another record uh, uh, for ice cubes, and then we, we there's no way to maintain kind of the um, the uh, invariant. We want only one record to represent ice cube. Yes, that's another problem. Any others? I have a whole list I can go through. Uh, okay, so uh, the first problem, um, or the first I guess series of problems, relates to uh, uh, data integrity. So. One problem might be is how do we ensure that the artist is the name, uh, the, the name of the artist is the same for each um, album entry. So if you remember, um, in order to figure out, you know, kind of which uh, um, artists have released which albums, we store the artist name in the album uh, CSV file. So um, imagine that that uh, you know you. you uh, Type in a wrong uh, a wrong name to update one of the the uh, album rows, or um, you know an artist changes their name, or uh, that sort of thing. So how how do you ensure that there's consistency between the name that an artist lists in the um, artist file and the name that the artist lists in the uh, album's file? Uh, another problem that come up is you know what if someone overwrites um, the album year um, in the, the album file with an invalid string. So in that code I showed, you, you're expecting an integer um, that, that represents uh, a year when um, the album was released. If someone comes in and puts in just a, a regular string, um, then your, your code's going to break. Uh, there's going to be a problem parsing it. Um, and again, there's no kind of, uh, I guess you could have access control on your files, but you know, once someone's able to get in the file, they can just make a mistake uh, and put in an invalid value for a particular field. Uh, what if there are multiple artists on an album? So uh, everything I showed, um, you know, each, each album only had an individual artist, so it's just one um, field in the CSV string, but um, you know, imagine that there's a, a, a multiple artists on a, on a like a mixtape or something. So, um, in that case, I guess you know you could um, uh, change the format. Instead of being a single string, you could put you know a, a comma separated list inside uh, the field of the CSV file. But then you're you know. Uh, um, Complicating your parsing code, you have to go back and adjust your parsing code to now handle, um, you know, potentially one or more uh, values in that field. And kind of the last problem, and I, th these are just a, a few that that I, you know, came up with here, but uh, there are many, many more. But uh, what happens if we delete an artist that has albums? So imagine that you know you, you deleted the record for 
um, Ice Cube in the uh, artist file, and now he has a bunch of um, uh, records or, or a bunch of records representing albums in um, the album table, and now there, there's no uh, uh, artist remaining that they link to. Okay, so that's kind of the data integrity side. Uh, from an implementation perspective, and uh, this was um, one of the, the points made, is how do you find a particular error? So again, an example, um, you end up in, in the code that I showed, iterating through every single row, every single time um, you want to find something. I mean, you, you, there are all sorts of ways to optimize it. For example, if you know the data is sorted, you could do like binary search or something. Um, or uh, if you have a, a data structure that stores it, maybe like a, a hash table or something, you could um, index directly to um, the, the, the record you're looking for. But just, you know, all of these things, you're building up additional complexity in your Python program that you have to write um, to access the code. So uh, all of that kind of implementation efficiency needs to be taken into consideration when, when you're designing your application. Similarly, what if we want to create a new application that uses the same database, so the database is stored in the CSV files. Imagine that you know, someone else for some other purpose wants to come along and access the same CSV files uh, concurrently. Do you want them to have to rewrite kind of all of the Python code that you've had built up, or uh, maybe you need to do it in a different language? Um, but the point is that kind of you've, you've had to do uh, the work to build up uh, the, this application, and now it has to be replicated every time someone else wants to access the same data. And even for you, um, you know, like I said, if you want to change the query or, or um, change change things that you're looking for, you run into the problem of having to kind of re-implement things from scratch every single time. So, um, kind of another implementation question is, what if two threads or two programs uh, try to Right to the, the file at the same time. You know, if, if I'm editing the file and you're editing the file, um, and we both save our work, um, who knows what's going to happen? Uh, you know, one of us might uh, overwrite the other, or uh, maybe both of our writes get partially written, and now you have kind of this garbage rec rec uh, record in there. So what you can end up with is um, kind of all of this. You, you have to implement some kind of concurrency layer uh, to manage concurrent accesses to. Uh, the, the data. So the final piece um, that I want to talk about is uh, durability, which means like what happens if the machine crashes when when the program is updating the record. So you're doing a write, um, power goes out or something, or or the your program crashes and uh, you know now what happens to the data? Is it consistent? Did you finish writing the whole record you wanted to write, or um, is it kind of a, a Half written now, and you have again this, this gar garbage value um, in your your uh, database. Uh, what if we want to replicate the database on multiple machines so we can have high availability? Um, how do we handle kind of concurrent writes to different machines um, because now the machines need to be synchronized across them? And kind of the list goes on and on and on uh, with all of these problems that. Can so that's kind of the, the reason why we want to build a database management system so we don't have to handle all of this complexity, all of those different types of problems that I mentioned in application code. Okay, so I explained what a database is. The software that manages a database is a database management system. Uh, sometimes people use the words interchangeably. I will try not to because um, it's confusing, but a database management system or DBMS is a system, the software that manages um, uh, the database and allows applications uh, to store, retrieve, and analyze information that's, that's stored in the database. So rather than managing things in these um, uh, CSV files, you can access them through the database and it kind of gives you all of these nice properties um, that, that avoid the problems that, that I mentioned before. And uh, a general purpose DBMS is designed to allow you to uh, define, create, query, update, and administer uh, databases 
uh, in, in a generic sense. So if you have, again, an application for um, managing students in a class or for managing um, an, an online music store, uh, kind of it's, it's general purpose enough that you can program your applications um, against the system. So this is really good for uh, uh, like business reasons, for your business or a startup or your, your organization, because the, the purpose, uh, the value add that you're bringing is not um, that you can store data, lots of people can store data, but um, what, what a database management system allows you to do is focus on you know, the, the core aspect of your business rather than worrying about all of these um, uh, issues surrounding actually managing the data. And, you know, DBMSs are, are widely tested and deployed um, so that they you know, find all the bugs, the concurrency bugs, the um, consistency bugs, all of those problems that come up um, because kind of, you know, the, the chances that, that every single Python program that you write is going to be 100% bug free all the time uh, are pretty much zero. So um, kind of the, 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 the whole point of a database management system is that you can leverage kind of this, this core set of functionality um, for managing databases so you don't have to do it manually at, in, in application code. So uh, uh, database management systems are not new. Um, the first one I think came out in 1965 um, at General Electric, was called IDM. And essentially, um, they, were, they were used kind of to, to manage data, but they were really uh, writing applications. Um, they were really difficult to build and maintain. And that's because people were working at a very low level, and there was, you know, really tight coupling between um, the logical layer, so kind of the, the data model layer, and, and the physical layer, that like the implementation, writing to disk, or reading things from disk, querying that kind of stuff. Um, so, kind of the 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 big problem is that you had to know the the queries that you wanted your uh, application to execute before you deployed the database, and um, they were just really cumbersome and not, not easy to work with. So um, kind of the things that, that we're gonna talk about over the course of the semester um, might seem obvious in retrospect, but at the time, uh, you know, people were struggling to build these applications and, and they were kind of controversial. The ideas were, were kind of controversial. So there was this guy um, at IBM named Ted Codd, uh, that's him, uh, who kind of observed that people were, were re-implementing the same things over and over again, reinventing the wheel. Um, and, and you know, making a lot of mistakes uh, uh, along the way. So he proposed kind of this, this uh, high-level idea called a relational model. And there's uh, this original, uh, I think it came out as a technical report in 1969, but nobody uh, reads this one. This is the one that everyone references. It came out a year later in 1970. Um, and it, it's a paper called A Relational Model of Data for Large Shared Data Banks. Um, and you know it's old because uh, people, uh, when, when they wrote in the, the, uh, the text, they spelled data and base as two separate words and how you have it uh, combined as one. But um, kind of the, the, the core idea that he proposed um, was the relational model. And he actually uh, won the Turing Award in uh, 1981, if you know what that is. Um, it's like uh, the, the People call it the Nobel Prize for computing. It's like the highest uh, uh, honor you can receive in, in computer science. And he, 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 uh, he won it for um, the relational model. And it, I, as I said, it was kind of um, uh, controversial at the time. I mean, you can look at it now and say, oh yeah, sure, that makes sense. But um, at the time, uh, it, it wasn't so obvious. So kind of the, the relational model at a high level is uh, a, a database abstraction to avoid a lot of the low level maintenance um, and problems that people are running into writing um, database applications. So uh, the, the, the kind of three main points um, that, that we're gonna to touch on are, are that the, the databases, database, databases should be stored in a simple uh, data structure called a relation. Um, where a relation essentially represents uh, uh, the relationship among attributes uh, 
uh, stored in a table. So like the relationship, if, if you um, are thinking about the, the uh, artist example, um, the relationship between the artist's name, um, the, the year uh, that, they, that they started producing music, and the, the country they're from. So the relationship between those attributes. Um, kind of the, the, the next piece is that uh, you thought you should access data through a high-level language um, rather than kind of telling the database, or database management system explicitly how, uh, how you wanted to get the data. Um, you could just specify what data you wanted and let the database management system figure out kind of the best strategy to do it. Um, because, you know, if, if uh, you're building a piece of software that specialized interactive databases, it should, it should be pretty uh, good at figuring out the best way uh, to get you the data you want. Um, and, and finally, uh, the, the, the last piece is that the physical storage of the data, either at the time uh, on, on disk or uh, secondary storage, um, now in memory also should be left up to um, the, the DVMS to implement. So you don't have to worry about whether it's laid out in, the, in a, a row format in a CSV file, it's just completely abstracted to you, you just know um, what the data is that's in there and get that and let the, the DVMS kind of figure out the specifics of, of storing it. And, you know, at the time, like I said, people argued that um, a DVMS would never be able to generate a query plan as efficient as uh, kind of what, what a human could do, uh, kind of like how people used to argue about you know, compilers, no one could ever um, produce code that's, uh, no, no uh, computer program or compiler could ever produce code that's as efficient as what uh, assembly that a human could write, and now almost no one writes at that level. So kind of it's the same idea. Um, the databases, there, there was a lot of, of human effort that went into uh, designing programs to efficiently access it because they thought that um, you couldn't design a, a, a system to do it uh, efficiently. So um, I, I mentioned that the relational model is a type of data model. So a data model is just essentially at a high level a collection of concepts uh, for describing the data that's stored in, in a database. So it's like a high level abstraction um, for, for how we're going to represent the data. Now, a schema um, is more specifically a description of a, a particular collection of data given a, a, a data model. So what does that mean? Um, it means that the, the schema defines exactly what we're going to store in the database. So for example, in the, the music store example, um, the schema would be the artist, table followed by the different uh, attributes that are associated with an artist. So that's the schema that you would define uh, that describes the data that's stored in the database. So there are, as I said, lots and lots of uh, different data models. Um, most DBMSs that you may have heard of um, are based on this first relational uh, data model and um, for a lot of reasons, but uh, probably the biggest one is that the, the relational model is uh, probably the most flexible of all of them. Um, the relational model can kind of model all of these other, or uh, um, you, you, you can represent all of these other data models using the relational model. Um, and the, the, the exact, you know, uh, uh, API or, or what's going on behind the scenes might not be as efficient, but um, is still general enough to be able to um, uh, handle all of these other models. So, um, NoSQL is a, is a, a popular term. Um, it means a lot of things uh, to a lot of different people, but just at kind of a high level, um, like for, if, for example, uh, it, it's more than just a data model. A lot of people, when they hear NoSQL, think about things like transactions or consistency or not having um, certain APIs, but just in terms of the actual NoSQL data model, it covers kind of this key value, uh, um, stores, graph, database management systems, document databases, um, like MongoDB, um, and, and kind of uh, a broader column family uh, databases. And um, kind of these, these data models are more uh, uh, restrictive than what you get with the relational model. 
um, and they, they don't give you as many as I said kind of guarantees in terms of um, different properties that we're going to discuss uh, over the course of the semester. Uh, and there, there are some, uh, just I'll finally say there are some application domains where um, these data models might make sense. So imagine, I don't know, you're storing uh, video data or you're storing uh, log data or something, you just want to shove it into a key value store that's, that's uh, uh, perfectly valid and, and might be better um, for that particular type of application than, than a relational database. Um, array and matrix uh, database management systems are uh, kind of specialized more towards uh, machine learning or um, scientific applications. There are a few, um, SciDB, uh, TileDB, but they're not, they're not really widespread and, and kind of they're um, narrowly focused on, on these sorts of use cases. And, and in the last group, um, hierarchical network and multi-value, um, these are kind of either obsolete data models that people tried out in the past and um, they find, found it didn't work well or they had other problems, um, but they, you know, they might still be hanging around in legacy systems. So for the purposes of this course, we're going to be focusing exclusively on uh, the relational model and um, how a database management system works in, in that context. Okay, so what is the relational model exactly? Um, the, the relational model uh, defines the, the relations inside the database. So like I mentioned, the uh, individual tables, um, sometimes in, in SQL they're called tables. Um, in the relational model they're called um, uh, relations. I, I'll probably end up using them interchangeably, um, but you can think of them just concretely as, as those examples from the music store. Um, there's the, the artist relation or table and the album um, relation. And the, the structure of the relational model defines those relations and uh, the contents inside them. So the next piece, as I mentioned, is integrity. Um, which ensures that the database's contents um, satisfy some constraints. So um, with the, the concern about you know, uh, uh, whether or not there could be a, a garbage string value um, inserted or overwritten on a, on a, um, uh, when you're expecting a, an integer uh, year, um, kind of the integrity aspect seeks to, to mitigate that problem. Uh, by forcing all of the, the year values to be integers and forcing that property. Uh, and finally, there's the, the manipulation aspect, which is the programming interface or API that you use to access and modify um, the contents of the, the database. And uh, this is what we're going to talk about later um, in, in the lecture uh, with relational algebra. So relational algebra is a... Is a um, uh, Programming, programming interface for interacting with um, the relational model. So uh, again, kind of just uh, uh, going through the example, a relation is an unordered set, so that's important. Um, uh, uh, there's no order to the values. Uh, we don't necessarily care what order they appear in um, in the database. Um, they could be sorted, they could not be sorted, uh, it doesn't matter, it's just a set. Um, and it, it contains the relationship uh, uh, of the attributes that represent entities. So, as I said, a, a relation or table has many entries that are called uh, um, tuples, tuples, some people say either, either is fine with me, um, but I'll, I'll probably end up saying both, but uh, tuples or uh, records also in a table tuple or record is interchangeable. There's, there's another word that sometimes people use uh, called rows. Um, I will try not to use that, I might accidentally, but uh, a row implies something specific about how the data is stored. So in the, the um, CSV example, you know, every, every uh, data was stored as a, an individual line. Um, but the, the uh, tuples and records represent individual uh, data entries in a table. Um, the, the values are uh, normally 
um, scalar values, things like integer strings, that's not necessarily true anymore. Um, the original specification, they all had to be kind of these scalar values, but um, kind of popular systems uh, have started relaxing to store things like uh, you can store a, an array maybe in, a, in an individual column or like a, a JSON document um, in an individual, individual um, uh, attribute. Um, and th there's also this notion of uh, a null, which is a member of every single uh, uh, domain. It can be any um, attribute can be set to null. And it, it's not exactly like null in uh, uh, like a null pointer or something, but uh, it, it's used to signify that we don't know what a particular value is. So for example, if, if um, the, the country that ice, ice cube is from uh, were null, it, it just means that we don't, we don't know what that value, uh, what, we don't know the specific value for that um, record. So uh, 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 again, just a, a relation is a, is a, a mathematical term that represents uh, this unordered set and um, uh, SQL, the SQL equivalent is a, is a table. So an entry relation, if I say an entry relation, it means that there's a table with n individual columns and individual attributes. So this is it's a, a three columns. Okay, so a, a big piece of um, the relational model is um, that every relation should have a primary key that uniquely identifies uh, a single tuple. So um, some DBMSs will, will automatically create this for you if you don't uh, specify it, they'll do it behind the scenes, kind of think about like a, an auto incrementing um, unique integer um, for, for keys. So in this, this uh, table example here, um, there's not really anything that we can use to uniquely identify. I guess, I mean, you could potentially use the name of the artist um, to uniquely identify it, but I, there's no guarantee that you know, all of those values are going to be unique. So um, what you can do is add kind of this surrogate primary key that's essentially just, a, just an integer. And like I said, it can be auto-generating or random or whatever. Um, kind of just to, to keep uh, each, each record or tuple um, unique. So foreign keys uh, are, are related to primary keys in that they specify um, that an attribute from one relation has a mapping uh, to, to some tuple in another relation. So just concretely, um, if we have this artist key here, and we have the album key, we know that uh, the artists, so the, the new primary key ID numbers that we've added to the album table, um, the artists, uh, one, two, three, seven, eight, nine, reference artists stored, tuples stored in the uh, artist table. So if we want to know, um, you know, who wrote one of these, or who released one of these albums, we can go look up okay, what's the number um, of the artist, and then go look up which artist that is uh, in, in the artist table. But, you know, there's a problem you can run into, uh, which is, I, I mentioned earlier, which is what if you want to have um, multiple artists uh, on, on a single album? So, again, you release like a mixtape or something, we have a lot of different artists contributing, but we only have this one um, attribute to store uh, the artist ID. And the, the solution that we come up with in uh, uh, the relational model is to create this uh, a third table, sometimes called the join table, which is going to join or link um, the artist table with the album table. So what we're going to do is we're going we're to get rid of that artist column in the album table and instead uh, create this new artist album table that has only two things in it. So there's an artist ID and an album ID. And now, if, if you look at it, we can figure out, okay, here is how all of the uh, artists link to the, the albums that they, they release. So in, in the case where you have, um, you know, one uh, uh, artist on an album, and there's only going to be one uh, tuple in the artist album relation, in the case where you have multiple, you'll have now multiple tuples.
Okay, so data manipulation languages or DML are um, the specific methods that, that we use to store and retrieve um, information from a database. And they come specifically in, in two flavors. So the first is procedural, uh, and that's uh, uh, that, that a high-level query should specify how the DBMS should compute the answer to our query. So the key word here is how. You're telling the database how you want it to retrieve the data. And this is going to be a, a relational algebra that we talked about uh, in, in a couple slides here. Um, you're saying specifically how you want the data to be retrieved from the database. Uh, the alternative is a non-procedural or declarative language um, where uh, you only specify what data you want retrieved from the database. You don't, you don't tell the database management system how you want to get it back. You just say uh, what data you want and then the, the system goes and figures out how to, how to do that for you. So um, an, an example of this non-procedural uh, or declarative language um, is relational calculus. I, I, we're not going to talk too much about relational calculus in this class. Um, it's important, it's uh, really important for query optimization, um, but it's, it's not really going to be covered in this class, so don't worry too much about it. Um, relational algebra and relational calculus are, are uh, they, they're logically equivalent, um, but we're, like I said, only going to be focusing on, on uh, this first one. Another example of a, a a declarative language is SQL, um, which we're going to talk about next class. So, relational algebra defines the original. The original um, specification defines these uh, seven operators, and they're all fundamental operations that you can use uh, to retrieve and manipulate the the tuples in a relation. So this, this, these are the, the fundamental operators proposed by um, Cott. And um, they're based on uh, ma mathematical ideas of uh, uh, set algebra. So each operator listed here is going to take in one or more relations as input, and it's going to output a new relation. So um, in order to build up a query to, to get the data you want out of your database, uh, you can kind of chain these operators together um, to create more complex operations. So we'll just kind of go through each one, starting with uh, select. Um, sorry, is there a question? No. Um, so uh, starting with select, essentially the, the goal of the select operator is to uh, choose a, a subset of the, the tuples from a relation um, that satisfy a particular predicate that, that you uh, provide. So the predicate, you can think about it acting like a filter or kind of like an if statement. Um, that's only going to retain uh, the tuples that qualify um, for, for the, the user-specified predicate. And you can, of course, combine um, multiple, multiple predicates using um, conjunctions or disjunctions uh, to get exactly the, the, the uh, subset that you want. I, I think it's called restrict in the original um, relational model, model paper, but um, everyone, everyone calls it a select. Uh, the, the symbol is the lowercase sigma um, uh, in, in relational algebra. So just as an example, we have this really simple relation here. Uh, R, it only has two um, attributes or columns, AID and BID. Uh, so if we want to, for example, uh, restrict um, or filter the uh, relation to only cases where AID equals A2, then we apply that uh, predicate and we get back uh, just that subset that satisfies the predicate that we, that we specified. And as I said, you can kind of chain things together and then say, okay, give me all of the, the records where AID equals A2 and um, BID equal or is greater than uh, 102. So in this case, you can see you're, you're only going to get that one um, tuple. Uh, and then if you're wondering how this, how this works with SQL, I, I apologize, I didn't come up with the, the naming convention, but the, the select relational algebra operator maps to the where clause in a SQL statement. Um, 
might be a little confusing, but select in relation algebra maps to where clause. Uh, and again, we'll talk more about SQL uh, next time, so we'll go through these uh, individual pieces. But um, the projection statement is essentially going to generate a relation um, with tuples that only contain the attributes that you ask for. And what does that mean? You can do all sorts of things like rearrange the order of the attributes. Um, you can manipulate the values of the attributes, um, do different types of modifications. It's, uh, it's specified with a lowercase pi symbol and, and essentially a list of all of the different um, modifications you want to make. So um, here is just a, an example query uh, where uh, again, we're doing the selection first, so I mentioned you could chain them together. We're doing the selection first to get only the records that have AID equals A2, and then we're performing a, a projection um, where we're going to modify B by subtracting 100, and we're going to put, you know, swap the order of um, BID and AID, and that's, that's kind of the result you get. So again, this is a, a, I didn't come up with the names. Um, but the projection operator maps to the uh, select clause of the SQL statement. So the, the selection operator maps to the where clause, the projection operator maps to the select clause. The uh, union operator is essentially going to um, generate a relation that contains all the tuples that appear in um, either or, or both relations. Uh, it's just like a, a set union. Um, so for example, imagine we have another second table here, S, which has the same schema as the first one. Um, to perform uh, R union S is going to give us essentially all of the tuples that appear in R, all of the tuples that appear in S. And uh, the, the SQL syntax for this is a little bit different. It's union all in order to get um, potential uh, duplicates um, because of a, a difference between um, uh, set algebra and like a, a, a bag or multi-set algebra. So you can see here that there are there is the, the, the duplicate that appears in, in the uh, union. So in, in this example, I, the, the output is ordered, but that's again not necessarily going to be true um, because it's a set that could appear in uh, the, the output relation could appear in any order. And the answer would still you know still considered correct. So you can't count on the, the order in there. Uh, the intersection operator um, is going to generate a relation that only contains the tuples that appear in both of the input relations. So it's R intersect S. Again, it's the same um, example where R and S both have the same schema. And what we want to do is find kind of the intersection. Uh, it's going to give us only A3 appears in both R and S. So you can do this in, uh, in SQL using the, the intersect. Operator. So, just as an example of when this might be useful, uh, if you think about the, the music store example, um, maybe we have one relation representing the rap artists and another one representing um, rock or country artists, and you want to know which artists have um, you know, both rap albums and you know, rock or country albums. So, you would just do an intersection of the two um, relations to get that answer. The difference operator. Um, is going to generate a relation that contains only the tuples that appear in the first relation and not the second relation. Uh, so in, in this example here, you end up with only the, the unique ones that appear in, appear in R and not in S. And you can do that in SQL using the accept um, keyword. Okay, the product um, is essentially going to generate a relation that contains all of the possible combinations of tuples from um, the, the both input relations. So um, sometimes it's called a Cartesian product, um, but it's the, it's the product of, of two relations. It's going to be all the pairwise combinations. Uh, so essentially what you're going to get from doing um, the product of RNS is kind of all of these uh, uh, pairwise combinations of tuples from, from both relations. Um, this might seem kind of useless, uh, but it, it does show up sometimes. Um, you know, if you want to get generate all the possible combinations um, in, in two tables. Uh, but more importantly, what, what this is going to be used for is just uh, from a, a conceptual or theoretical perspective, 
um, it's going to let us model the next operator we're going to talk about, which is a, a join. So kind of you can get all these, these pairwise um, combinations. Uh, this is the, the syntax in SQL um, for how to do it. Um, you can get all of these pairwise combinations, but now let's say that you just want the pairwise combinations where your primary key that we talked about and your foreign key match. So you have two keys that match. So the join operator is going to generate a relation that um, contains all, all the tuples that are a combination of um, the, the two inputs where there's a common value for one or more attributes depending on, on what you specify. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to look for um, matches here. And uh, again, these two tables have the same schema, but you could do it in an arbitrary case. In the, the music store example, you have the artist uh, a relation and the, the album's relation, and they share the, um, uh, the artist's uh, primary key that they join on. So um, what's happening here with the join uh, operator is that we're, we're only finding the matches, like I said, uh, that appear in both uh, the, the R table and the S table. So, uh, like I said, kind of this, this conceptually, if you think about what, it, what the, the um, product operator does, you could produce all of these pairwise optimizations, or sorry, so you produce all these pairwise combinations and then um, filter it down to just uh, uh, the, the set that matches uh, where the keys match. But of course, you'd never do this um, I, because you know you have to first enumerate all the, the different uh, uh, combinations and then perform the filter. So there are different optimizations you, you might want to do to short circuit this. But from a, a theoretical perspective, conceptual perspective, it's useful um, to think about uh, in this way. So uh, the, the SQL syntax for this, and again, we'll go over these in, in more detail. Um, next class, but the SQL syntax to do this join here um, is the, the natural join operator. Um, so uh, over time, like I said, there there have been um, extensions to the original uh, relational algebra where they built up more operators. Uh, there's now a, a bunch that people have added: rename, assignment, duplicate elimination, aggregation. Imagine you want to count how many. Um, Albums a particular artist has released uh, sorting, so you can actually impose some kind of ordering uh, on the unordered set um, and, and set division. So there are analogs for all of these in SQL that, that we'll talk about. Don't, don't worry too much about them. They're not um, going to be super important for uh, the course. Um, so just an observation about relation, relational algebra. Um, kind of we've gone through all the operators, but it's still defining more or less the high level steps that are necessary for how to compute a query. So essentially, we're telling um, the, the database management system exactly how it should go about computing a query. And in the example here, um, we have two, you know, more or less equivalent queries. On, on uh, the one side, you're doing uh, the join between R and S first before applying the filter to only the tuples that have BID 102. And on the other side, uh, you're filtering S to only the tuples that have 102, uh, BID equals 102, and then performing the join. So kind of these, these two, while they're going to produce the exact same answer, one might be a lot more um, efficient than the other. You know, if you have, again, a billion tuples in the relation, um, you might want to do the filtering first, uh, so you can get it down to just one, rather than having to you know, find all the billion matches and then, then do the filter. So in this way, um, the, the, the uh, relational algebra is still procedural and not declarative. So really what we'd like is, is a declarative language like SQL for accessing um, the database. And that's kind of this idea where you want to state the, the high-level answer or exactly what you want the database management system to compute for you rather than telling it how it should go about doing it. And essentially, you can just leave the low-level details about you know, how to actually do it to the database management system. And uh, if it's well implemented, it should do it um, a lot better than, than um, the, the kind of 
high level procedural uh, query you would produce. So the relational model, just as a concept, is independent of any kind of specific um, query language implementations. There are a lot that got proposed over the years. Um, I think there was Alpha proposed, originally proposed by COD, but no one talks about that anymore. Uh, there's Quell, uh, which is produced by someone from Berkeley. Um, and SQL kind of emerged as the de facto standard. Some people call it SQL. Um, some people call it SQL. Both are fine. Uh, I'll still know what you're talking about if you say either. Um, so it's kind of emerged as the de facto standard. Um, and there are standard specifications, but uh, pretty much every um, uh, system implements its own uh, variant. So uh, if you write a, a query for MySQL, it might not exactly match something that runs in Postgres or Oracle or SQLite or whatever. Uh, so kind of that's the tricky part. There is a standard that everyone like you know 98% adheres to, but there's this kind of wiggle room where people implement their own special um, divergences. So Going way back to the Python example I gave earlier, this was the uh, code where you're going to iterate over all the lines in the file um, to find the year that Ice Cube went solo. And if we rewrite that in, in uh, a SQL query, we get this a lot more compact specification for what we want and not how we want the database management system uh, to, to give it to us. So we say we want to select the year from the artist's table where the name of the artist is Ice Cube. So that's a lot uh, a higher level, and we don't have to worry about kind of the low level details about reading the lines, parsing the lines, all that stuff. We just tell the database management system, this is what we want, uh, this is the answer that we want, you figure out how, how to get it back to me. So that kind of wraps everything up. Um, the, the key takeaways are that you know databases are ubiquitous. They're used in all sorts of applications all over the place. There's any amount of data being managed in an application you're using. Um, there is almost certainly a database management system behind the scenes. Um, relational algebra kind of defines the, the primitives for processing queries on a relational database. And uh, we're going to see relational algebra again when we talk about um, query optimization and execution. Um, but for now, the next class is going to be uh, specifically about SQL. We're going to go through some of the more advanced uh, topics with, with SQL. So um, that's it. And uh, we'll see you on Wednesday. Thanks. About the St. Ives brew, one through a can or two. Share with my crew is magnificent. Bust is mellow. And for the rest of the commercial, I pass the mic on to my no fellow. Need for a mic check, bust it. The bees are set, then grab a 40. The flim New Yorker snap his neck. St. Ives. Take a sip, then wipe your lips. Cue my 40's getting warm. I'm out, he got the dip. Drink it, drink it, drink it, then I burp. After I slurp, ice cube. I put in much work. With the BMT and the E-Trouble, get us a St. Ives brew on the double.